Hello students. Today you will study the second part of patterns of inheritance. Let's look at the rules of probability. Mendel's laws reflect the rules of probability. Early pairs, these early pairs, are segregate during gamete formation, right? And this each gamete is going to fuse, combine to form genotype in the next generation. Maybe this gamete can fuse with this gamete, or maybe this can fuse with this gamete, this one fuse with this one, this one also has this one. We will consider about what could be probability of a certain genotype in next generation. So think that this as a female and this as male. For in order to produce this genotype in offspring, large Y, small Y, from this genotype, egg must carry large Y. And so we will consider about only this genotype. So the female uh, produce egg uh, during meiosis, and then the egg must carry a large Y. And then the sperm must carry small Y. Okay. All right, so only think about this genotype for a while. And then the probability that egg, the egg will have large Y allele is one out of two. You have a two allele, and then if you want to take only this large Y allele, the chance is one out of two. Okay? And also, uh, in case of a sperm, if you want to have allele small Y, the probability of small y allele is also one over two. See, because you have a two allele. Then you need to combine this large y allele with small y allele. Then the probability that the two large y, small y alleles will come together at fertilization is, you have to multiply one over two, multiply one over two equal one over four. So you will have this one has one over four and also it shows one over four. This is exactly the answer given by the Pumnet square you see. So if you know the genotype of a parent, you can predict the probability for any genotype among the offspring. Okay. That is called rules of probability. So this kind of a probability can be applied when you toss the coin. A tossed coin has a half chance of landing heads and a half chance of landing tails. If two coins are tossed simultaneously, the outcome for each coin is unaffected by the other coin. It's an independent event. So the probability of such a dual event is the product multiplication of the separate probability of the independent events for the coin. Okay, so, so each event take as independent event and then you multiply so that you can get the probability of a dual event. So the outcome of any particular toss is an independent event unaffected by what has happened on previous attempts. And then this can hold true for independent event in genetics as well as coin tosses. So the rule of multiplication calculates the probability of two independent events both occurring. 
let's look at some case. By applying the rules of probability, we can solve some uh, more complex gen genetic problems. So far, you study monohybrid and dihybrid, but even uh, trihybrid cross, we can calculate the probability of a certain genotype in the following generation. So the trihybrid cross means three different characters are involved. Um, so the question is consider, uh, read the question, read the question. So large A, small A, large B, small B, large C, small C, self-fertilize, and then oh, the question want to know about the probability of a genotype of small a, small a, small b, small b, small c, small c. I told you that even though they deal with the three traits, you have to think about each trait as an independent event. So you just take this and this as one event, and this and this as a second event, this is the third event. So because each allele pair assert independently, you can create this trihybrid cross as three separate monohybrid cross. So from this cross, the probability of a small a, small a offspring occurred one over four. How you can know about that? You just quickly draw Putnam square. Okay, so large A from here, the gamete is large A, small a, and then from this genotype, you will get gamete, large A, small a, and then small a, small a appear one out of four. Okay. In the same token, large B, small B, cross large B, small B, probability of a small B, small B offspring will appear also one over four. Same thing, small C, small C offspring will occur one over four. So the probability that the offspring will be small a, small a, small b, small c is going to be, you are going to multiply all this probability. Therefore, the answer is 1 over 64. Okay. Now, next question. Try this. Please take out some separate paper and do simple math. So first, first event, large A, small A, cross, large A, small A, and then you want to know the probability of this genotype, large A, large A. So you will draw Pernet square, you have to draw Pernet square, but only Pernet square for monohybrid. You don't have to draw Pernet square for trihybrid. You can do that and then you will get 64, kind, 64 genotypes in Pernet square. That occupies a lot of space. And so you just separate this one trait, another one, another trait, and then treat them as like a monohybrid cross. So from this one, you will have a large A, small A as a gamete. And then from this, large A, small A. And then the probability you will have large A, large A is one out of four. So this is going to be one out of four. What about large B, large B? Also one out of four from the cross between these and these. Okay. What about large C, large C? From this and this cross, you generate Pernet square 
and then you will find out this also 1 out of 4. Now, this genotype carries three traits simultaneously. Even though you calculate independently, but this genotype carries three traits at the same time, so you have to multiply this probability. So the answer is this one. So you might have these similar kinds of question on the next uh, lecture exam. Another question is, how many unique gametes could be produced through independent assortment by an individual with a genotype? This one. This is more than tri uh, hybrid. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, traits uh, expressed in one genotype. So, also, generation gametes, the probability of gametes is independent event. So you will consider early pairs as a different trait. So from here, what kind of gamete do you have? Large A or small A? How many kinds? Two. What kind of gamete you will have? Large B and small B? So two. What kind of gamete you will have from large C, large C? One large C, the other gamete also large C. So this is one kind of gamete. Large D, small D, how many kinds of gamete? Two. Large E, large E, one. Large F, small F, two. Large G, large G, one. Large H, small H, two. Then, what could be the combination of uh, different unique gametes can be produced? You will have rule of multiplication. So all multiply this. And then you will have, this is four, this is four, and this is eight. Therefore, the answer is 32. Four multiply eight, 32. So far, we review the Mendel's laws, but today you will learn about, there are some other kinds of inheritance pattern. And then some patterns of inheritance does not obey Mendel's laws. So there's some deviation of patterns of inheritance from Mendel's inheritance. So inheritance patterns are often more complex than predicted by simple Mendelian genetics. The relationship between genotype and phenotype is rarely as sim simple as in the pea plant characters Mendel study. Many heritable characters are not determined by only one gene with the two alleles. Nevertheless, the basic principles of segregation and independent assortment apply even to more complex patterns of inheritance. So there are some variations on Mendel's laws. However, basic principles of Mendel's law is still applicable to the patterns of this modified inheritance. Let's see the case which do not follow Mendel's laws. So inheritance of characters by a single gene may deviate from simple Mendelian patterns. What are the case? When alleles are not completely dominant or recessive, do you remember when the heterozygous alleles usually always provide one kind of a phenotype? It depends on dominant allele. But the heterozygous allele are not completely dominant or recessive. Or when a gene has more than two alleles, you have two alleles, right? But there are more than two alleles for one character. For example, your blood type. A blood 
type, B below the type, and AB below the type, and O below the type. So there is a gene for below the type, but the phenotype appears, what? Four types of blood. And then there are three kinds of alleles. So more than two alleles. Some other cases when a gene produces multiple phenotypes. It's a single gene, but this single gene really is kind of cascade phenomena. One gene influences many phenotypes. Those cases do not exactly follow Mendel's law. So complete dominance, incomplete dominance, in codominance, these are the relationship between dominant and recessive allele. So in case of a complete dominance is the F1 offspring of Mendel's P cross always look exactly like one of the two parental varieties. Okay, this situation is called complete dominance. Okay, so heterozygous and then one uh, dominant homozygous are identical. So when this one is homozygous and the next generation has heterozygous, but this phenotype and this phenotype are identical. We call that complete dominance. So this complete dominance obey Mendel's law. But there is some other case such as incomplete dominance. Incomplete dominance means the phenotype of F1 hybrid is somewhere between phenotype of two parental varieties. So kind of it shows intermediate phenotype. So this intermediate phenotype cannot be found from either parents because this dominant allele does not fully express in next generation. We call that incomplete dominance. Okay. So the appearance of F1 hybrids fail between the phenotype of the two parental varieties. Well, we call this effect incomplete dominance. Code dominance. Two dominant alleles affect the phenotype in separate, distinguishable way. This is A, B, O blood type. We will study that a little bit later. So let's look at incomplete dominance. Both alleles are partially expressed. And need, so when you cross a red flower with a white flower, according to Mendel's first law, the next generation should show 100% red flower. But instead of a red flower, they show pink color. This pink color was not exist in either parents. Okay? So neither red nor white alleles are dominant. Offspring shows a third phenotype that is something between the parents' phenotype, kinds of a compromise. So it shows intermediate phenotype. So this is a parent, and this is F1. And this F1 hybrid self fertilize in next generation. In F2, genotypic ratio is phenotypic, and genotypic ratio is the same one, two, 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 one. In According to Mendel's law, in F2 generation, phenotypic ratio appears three to one, and genotypic ratio was one, two, 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 one. But in case of incomplete dominance, it shows genotypic and phenotypic ratio both are same. Here's, and then here also large Y, small Y. And then in next generation, this is three to one ratio is phenotype ratio. But from this cross, look at the genotype. Large Y, large Y, and large Y, small Y. Large Y, small Y, and small Y, small Y. 
then genotypic ratio is large y, large y, two, large y, small y, one, small y, small y. That's why one, two, 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 one. But this genotype shows same phenotype. So phenotypic ratio is a three to one. Phenotypic ratio is one to two to one. According to Mendes, a hybrid, monohybrid cross, right? But incomplete dominance looks like a, a red snapdragon, white snapdragon, they cross and then F1 generation, the flower color appears pink. Neither red nor white. So both allele cannot be dominant, cannot be recessive in F1 generation. And then the third phenotype appear, it appears pink. And then it has this genotype. Okay? And then once this genotype self fertilize in F2 generation, the phenotype ratio one, two, two to one in terms of red flower, pink flower, white flower. Also, genotypic ratio is, this is one, this and this two, and this is only one. From incomplete dominance, the phenotype of heterozygous differ from the two homozygous varieties, and the genotypic ratio and phenotypic ratio are both one to two to one in F2 generation. And the relationship between dominance and phenotype. Then the dominant allele means when F1 hybrid shows a phenotype, that allele refers to as dominant allele. So dominant allele does not subdue a recessive allele. Alleles do not interact that way. Uh, for any character, dominance, and recessiveness relationships of allele depends on the level at which we examine the phenotype. Said that when you see the phenotype at F1 generation, according to the dominant allele, we call that allele dominant. When you look at hybrid phenotype, if that phenotype does not show, does not express by certain allele, we call that allele recessive allele. So a trait being dominant does not mean that it is normal or more common than a recessive trait. Rather, dominance means that heterozygous, such as maybe, for example, large A, small A, heterozygous display the dominant phenotype, this phenotype not from this phenotype. By contrast, the phenotype of a recessive allele, for example, small a, small a, is seen only in homozygote. And then this recessive trait may in fact be more common in the population than dominant ones. In human world, when people carry this recessive allele more than people's population who have this heterozygous allele. The extra finger or extra toe, they are dominant. But most people on the earth carry recessive allele. Therefore, most people have a five finger and five toes. So the allele for this unusual trait is dominant to the allele for the more common trait of a five digits or appendage. Multiple allele. Most genes exist in population in more than two allelic forms. So far, we discuss inheritance patterns involving only two alleles per gene. But some genes can be found in population in more than two versions, known as multiple allele. The example is ABO blood type phenotype. ABO blood group phenotype in humans involve three alleles of a single gene. 
So blood type gene, but there are three alleles, not two alleles. Of course, in this course, we will only think about Rh plus blood group. And there is another blood group called Rh minus blood group, but Rh plus or Rh minus uh, due to inheritance of a separate unrelated gene. So in this course, we do not study Rh minus case. We only study the case of Rh plus blood group. And then as you know, there are four kinds of blood type, A blood type, B blood type, AB blood type, and O blood type. In order to determine four kinds of blood type, three different alleles play, and then they determine certain kind of blood type, one out of four. So various combinations of three alleles, such as I, A, I, B, and small i, produce four kinds of blood type that are A or B or AB or O blood type. What is the meaning of this I? I is uh, like a person's red blood cell coated with a carbohydrate. So these three are least for the enzyme. Some enzyme produce a carbohydrate that determine A blood type. Some enzyme coat B types of carbohydrate on red blood cell, then that blood type will be determined as B blood type. When enzyme produce carbohydrate A and B, both carbohydrate, then that blood type will be AB blood type. When enzyme does not produce any kinds of a carbohydrate, then that blood type will be called type O. Let's look at this one. So this is red blood cell. And then some enzyme put carbohydrate A. The blood type B, then this person, there's enzyme produce carbohydrate B and this carbohydrate B attached to outside the red blood cell. Person whose blood type AB, that person has enzyme can produce carbohydrate A and B and this A and B can attach it, associate outside the red blood cell. Blood O type person, that person does not have any enzyme to produce carbohydrate A or B, so none of the carbohydrates attach it outside the red blood cell. So various combinations of three alleles called IA, IB, like this, this is one allele, this is another allele, and then this will has both allele, and this one has no. So this is gonna be right down just like this, small i. And these three kinds of alleles produce four types of blood phenotype. And matching comparable blood type is critical for safe blood transfusion. If you have a type A blood, you need to receive blood from type A or type O. If donors' blood types have a carbohydrate that is foreign to the recipient, then the recipient immune system produces protein called antibody. So type A person receive blood from type B, then this type B blood has antigen B when the person receive blood transfused from type B to A. And then inside the body of a person whose blood type A recognize that, oh, our body, my body is supposed to have a carbohydrate A attached to red blood cell. But I can see some blood has different types of carbohydrate attached to red blood cell. Then person with type A blood think that, oh, this is a foreign invader. 
and then the person produce antibody against this carbohydrate B and then try to bind them. Okay, so the donor's blood have a carbohydrate that is foreign to the recipient. Then the recipient immune system produce protein called antibody. This antibody is gonna bind here, bind to type B blood. This cause the donor's blood cell clumped together. Potentially this clump prevent the blood flow so eventually killing the recipient. The clumping reaction is basis of a blood type test performed in the laboratory. You need to know your blood type. So in emergency case, the hospital can determine what kind of blood type you will receive. If that does not match it well, it causes a serious problem. So this is another table to summarize. And a blood type will have red blood cells coated by carbohydrate A. Blood type B person has carbohydrate B. This carbohydrate B coat outside the red blood cell. A, B, they produce both carbohydrate. And then O, it does not have any carbohydrate outside the red blood cell. So each person inherit one of these alleles from each parent. You know, to set up alleles, you only need to have two alleles. See, two identical chromosomes, not three identical chromosomes. Therefore, when you have three kinds of allele, you have probability to choose one first allele, you have one out of three. So the leftover is two. So you have a chance, either one. So multiply two equal, you have six. So there are three alleles, therefore you will have six possible genotypes. And when you look at this, the relationship between allele, allele IA and allele IB are dominant to allele small i. Thus, you can have an allele like this. One out of six cases, this can be. And also, you can have this allele. And also, you can have this kind of allele. So, IA, IB alleles are dominant to small i, small i allele. In this case, person who carries this allele is obviously type A. But in this case, a small i allele is recessive to I A allele. This also appears as blood type A. Same thing, one person can have B blood type, that person can have this kind of allele. Or one allele IB and second allele is small i. Small i is a recessive allele because of it has at least one IB allele. This person will have B blood type. Okay. Then what about AB blood type? That person will have this genotype. And O blood type is a recessive allele. There's no IA, there's no IB. So when you look at this AB blood type, IA, IB alleles are co-dominant. They both are dominant. Both alleles are expressed in heterozygous individuals which have type AB blood. So it shows heterozygous, but it's co-dominant. They both dominant allele. In this case, only IB is dominant. A blood type, only IA is dominant. This is recessive. But in case of AB blood type, IA, IB, both alleles are co-dominant. Now, pleiotropy is a uh, most genes have multiple phenotypic effect. 
a property called pleiotropy. That means so far one gene shows one kind of a phenotype, but most genes has involved in multiple phenotype. So uh, pleiotropic alleles are responsible for the multiple symptoms of a certain hereditary disease, such as cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia, sickle cell disease. So this single gene affect some cascade following multiple phenotypic effect. We call that phenomena pleiotropy. Hope you know about the meaning of a pleiotropy. Let's look at the detailed situation. Sickle cell disease, single gene, influence several phenotypes. Single gene impact multiple phenotypes, multiple characters. The direct effect of the sickle cell allele is to make red blood cell produce abnormal hemoglobin protein. So red blood cell has like a donut shape. It's like a ring donuts, but the, the center part is not open. It's filled, but it's kind of concave curvature. So the center part is very thin, outside is thick. So this ring shaped donut. But this red blood cell, there's one gene called the sickle cell gene make ring shaped normal red blood cell change it to a sickle cell, sickle shaped, sickle shaped like this is curved and like this, look like a sickle and the edge is curved. Once this sickle cell formed, it caused many problems down the road. The direct effect of a sickle cell allele is to making red blood cell produce abnormal hemoglobin protein. Therefore, the sickle cell carries abnormal hemoglobin protein. Hemoglobin carries oxygen, you know that. So this abnormal hemoglobin protein tends to cluster together and crystallize. As hemoglobin crystallizes, the normal disc-shaped red blood cell deform to a sickle shape. Sickle cells are destroyed rapidly by the body. Your body has a good defense system, so once a sickle cell produced, your body want to get rid of them. Even though their destruction may lower down the individual's red blood cell count. That causes anemia, dizziness, and weakness. Also, sickle cell does not flow in the blood vessels smoothly because of their angular shape. This sickle cell tends to accumulate and clog tiny blood vessels. Do you have a capillary blood vessel? And in very tiny, narrow blood vessel, this sickle cell kinds of stuck together. So blood flow to body part is reduced, resulting in periodic fever, severe pain, and damage of other organs such as kidney or liver, okay, heart, brain. So the overall result is the cascade of symptoms. We call that single gene allele, single allele, cause several problems. We call that pleiotropy. Okay, so overall result is the cascade of symptoms. Blood transfusion and drug treatment can attenuate this kind of symptoms, but still they cannot perfectly cure. Sickle cell anemia kills about 10,000 people per year. So this looks like a sickle cell. This is a normal red blood cell. In most cases, only people who are homozygous for the sickle cell allele have a sickle cell disease. If you have a heterozygous, you will not have such a disease. So sickle cell disease is the most common inherited disorder among people of African descendant. So one in 
500 African American has this sickle cell disease. Sickle cell allele. Among Americans of other ancestry, coming from Europe or Asia, the sickle cell allele is extremely rare. So you so far you study pleiotropy. Pleiotropy means one single allele influences many several phenotypes. We call that pleiotropy. And the example was a sickle cell disease. Another pattern of inheritance called epistasis. A gene at one locus alters the phenotypic expression of a gene at a second locus. So here's a gene A. And here's gene B. And then gene A produce A protein. DNA produce protein. And this A protein regulate to produce of B protein. It regulate the production of gene B. So depending on A protein, if A protein present, then gene B translate produce B protein. If A protein cannot be provided for the process for translation, then the gene B cannot produce B protein. So there is some interrelationship between two genes. We call that epistasis. A gene at one locus alter the phenotypic expression of a gene at a second locus. Labrador retrieves and many other mammals, coat color depends on two genes. So one gene determines the pigment color. Maybe a large B determines black color, small B determines brown color. But the other gene, such as E gene, determine whether this pigment, black pigment or brown pigment, will be deposited in their form. So if this E gene is not dominant, if this E gene is recessive, then the pigment, black pigment, brown pigment, cannot be deposited. Therefore, the Rebrado cannot show black color nor brown color. If color is a prince, then it may be determined by the presence of a large E gene. So large E, large E allele, or large E, small E allele, these two genotypes result in color. Both has black color because they carry large B allele. But they also have a heterozygous of E gene. They cross this Labrador cross, and then you will see the pattern. You will you set up next square, and then you will pull out this sixteen genotype in next generation. Look at each genotype. When Labrador has at least one large E allele, then this pigment gene large B shows black color. But when you look at here, still large E, then this Labrador has a small b, small b, small b shows brown pigment. So it shows a brown color Labrador. But when you look at here, small e, small e, and then this, even this Labrador has a large b, two large b allele, not even one, but because of these small e, small e recessive allele does not make this large B allele express color. Therefore, it shows yellow color. I said no color in case of no color means yellow color in uh, Labrador. Look at uh, this one. Also, in this case, small b, small b. This Labrador express 
a brown pigment. It makes brown pigment, but this brown pigment cannot be deposited in their fur, in their skin. Why? There is no dominant large E allele, therefore it shows yellow color. So the phenotype shows 9, 2, 3, 2, 4 Labrador in terms of black, brown, yellow. So in other words, if a dog has a genotype, smory, smory, Labrador will be yellow, no matter what it carries, large B, large B, or small B, small B, because no pigment will be deposited in the four according to small E, small E, recessive allele. Uh, let's think about human traits. Uh, human traits follow Mendelian patterns of inheritance. Humans are not good subject for genetic research because the generation time is too long. You cannot make people marry in order to see next generation. Also, parents produce relatively few offspring. So there is some difficulty to engage in human genetics. Nevertheless, there is some record we can trace of. Geneticists collect information about a family's history for a trait. Okay, so you can do a survey. Do your parents have this kind of trait? What about your grandparents? Okay, do you know the uh, grandfather's family side and grandmother's side? And then do they have any trait? Something like that. So family history can be traced up. This information is assembled into a family tree. We call that pedigree. So pedigree describes the trait of parents and children across generation. So we will see this look like a pedigree. You okay, hear this affected male marry with unaffected female. And the next generation, the children has some of them affected, some of them do not affect it. The same thing, this affected man marry with affected woman from other family. Then the next generation, we will figure out what kind of uh, uh, affected child uh, occur. So this panel shows two kinds of a family tree. Here is one is this one. And the other one is a separate thing. So left panel shows widow's peak versus a straight hairline. Widow's peak is here. This hairline is like widow's peak. And then here is just more like straight hairline. So it's a widow's peak is a dominant trait or recessive trait. We can figure out that by looking at family tree. Also the right panel shows attached earlobe and free earlobe. Free earlobe is the, the bottom of ear lobe is detached from this mandible. And then this attached earlobe is the end of ear is attached to a mandible level, something like that. So is this attached ear lobe also inherited dominantly or recessively? We can figure out that by looking at this family tree, by looking at pedigree. Analyze the trait in the pedigree, then you can accurately determine whether that trait is orosomal dominant, orosomal recessive, or X chromosomal linked inheritance by applying some kinds of rules. There's some rules to determine autosomal dominant disorder, autosomal uh, recessive inheritance or X linked inheritance. There is some special characteristic to each category of inheritance. But when you look at this family tree pedigree, we can determine all oh, widow's peak is orosomal dominant inheritance or orosomal recessive inheritance. Okay, so we will study that from now on. Dominantly inherited disorder. 
So some human disorders are caused by one dominant allele. Only one allele is sufficient to cause the disorder. So dominant alleles can cause little disease, a rare case. Usually, in case, uh, if dominant, two dominant alleles can cause a little disease, that is very not common, very rare case. But usually, um, heterozygous, heterozygous, at least one allele, uh, dominant allele can cause the disease. If person carries two dominant allele, homozygous dominant allele, then the person easily become fatal. So this order, in case of this order, is carrying one dominant allele means that person has disorder. When person has a recessive allele, that person is healthy. We call that orogenal dominant disorder. An affected child must have at least one affected parent. This is the main characteristic of orosomal dominant inheritance. Affected child must have at least one affected parent. Therefore, this affected child must receive that dominant allele from one affected parent. If both parents are affected, of course, we can include that case as orosomal dominant inheritance. What could be the example? Huntington disease or dwarfism are the orosomal dominant inheritance. So orosomal dominant uh, disorder, I said, the health person is what? Carrying two recessive alley. If a person has at least one dominant allele, that person is, has a disorder. Okay. So a healthy person marry with disorder person. And then the offspring, the children will have, if the child has this genotype, they will have a disorder. If some child has recessive homozygous, then those persons are healthy. Uh, the example is Huntington disease. Huntington disease, you heard about this, it's kind of a degenerative disorder of nervous system. And then this Huntington disease does not appear until the person's age reach 35 to 45 years old. Once uh, the deterioration of the nervous system begins, it is irreversible and fatal. It cannot go back to better uh, good condition. No, it's just deterioration keep going on, developed and then eventually fatal. Because the allele for Huntington disease is a dominant, any child born to a parent with the allele has a 50% chance of inheriting the allele and the disorder. This example um, make it clear that a dominant allele is not necessarily better than a corresponding, corresponding recessive allele. Okay. Dominant mean does not mean better. Dominant, dominant does not mean more. Okay. As you see from Huntington disease, this person carries single dominant allele, it causes disorder. So dominant allele is not necessarily better than a corresponding recessive allele. So when you have a recessive allele for this Huntington disease gene, then you are healthy, you are in better position. Okay. Also, polydactyly, it has more than extra finger, extra toes. It has more than five finger. This also 
dominant. All of them are dominant disorder. We cannot say disorder. I mean, there is no any, uh, this is a harmless condition. But even though this is a dominant allele, still majority of people on the earth only carry, only have five fingers, five toes. Dominant does not mean always more than recessive. This shows a good example. Dominant does not mean better or more. Another example is dwarfism. It's also autosomal dominant disorder. So when one person carries a dwarf gene, dwarf allele, recessive allele is a normal person. When they marry and then they have a dyskemi, this person has dyskemi, and then you will have this, the offspring. When offspring carries large dysmoldy, it turns out dwarf. When carry this one, it's normal person. And sometimes it has dwarf, married with dwarf. And then that person will have large D, large D. This is a little 